Perhaps I should start by telling you what this video is not about. It's not about the first 600 million years of Earth's existence, nor is it about Earth's initial atmosphere, a subject we can merely speculate about because whatever it may have been, it was swept away in the literally Earth-shattering cataclysm that led to the formation of our moon. Rather, this video is about Earth atmosphere too, from about 4 billion years ago until about 2 billion years ago. I'd also like to say a little about geologic time. I mean, geologic time is, of course, almost unfathomable. Beings that reckon their lives in decades and whose entire history as a species scarcely spans much more than 100,000 years are bound to have difficulty contemplating the vastness of Earth's history. So it's little wonder that some prefer the comfortable myths of our childhood. The Precambrian itself is huge, accounting for about 88% of the planet's total history. During that vast expanse of time, modern atmosphere evolved, plate tectonics began, the planet froze over, and most amazing of all, life began. So what was the atmosphere like four billion years ago? Well, it appears likely that the major atmospheric components were the same as the gases that we see being churned out by volcanoes today. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and uh, much smaller amounts of a variety of other gases. One gas that was virtually absent was free oxygen. We know this because the oldest rocks available to us show no hint of oxidation, and they exhibit a wealth of mineral constituents that only form in the absence of oxygen. The earliest sedimentary rocks we have available to us are the 3.85 billion year old rocks of western Greenland and those rocks tell us a number of things, um, some obvious, some more subtle. Uh, they tell us that there were continental land masses present 3.85 billion years ago, that chemical and physical processes of weathering were much the same, and that there were large bodies of water in which sediments were deposited over a vast period of time. Uh, interestingly enough about these um, initial or or continents is that they were apparently not formed by the plate tectonics that operate today. Rather they were formed through vast upwellings or mantle plumes of um, iron nickel rich materials and today their remnants are found as the various shields of continents indicated here on the map by the uh, dark orange color. An interesting problem concerning Earth history is the faint sun paradox. Modern models of the history of solar radiation indicate that four billion years ago, uh, at the beginning of the Archaean eon, solar radiation would have only been about 70% as intense as um, the radiation today. And yet, clearly, as indicated by the rocks from Greenland, there were liquid oceans, and so there was a reasonably equitable climate on Earth. And that's difficult to explain given the atmosphere that would be generated from volcanic gases alone. One idea about early life is that it consisted mainly of methanogens. Methanogens have a long history on Earth and are members of the archaea, uh, simple little bacteria-like organisms. They tend to live in places where there is an absence of oxygen. As a matter of fact, the one thing they can't tolerate is presence of oxygen. They like uh, extreme environments. Uh, they're tough little critters. They, you find them near um, deep ocean uh, volcanic vents underneath ice sheets, uh, in buried landfills, and in the guts of many organisms. One of their byproducts uh, is methane, and the idea or the hypothesis is that early life largely consisted of methanogens, which over many millions of years pumped out tons and tons of methane, which collected in the atmosphere and served as an efficient greenhouse gas and kept the um, atmosphere warm enough to sustain liquid oceans. Earlier I mentioned that the early continents and therefore the oceans were enriched in nickel and that's crucial to the lives of methanogens because they require a good deal of nickel for their metabolism. 
A bit under 3 billion years ago, plate tectonics first occurred, and this apparently is linked to cooling of the Earth's interior, a, a diminishment or cessation of the massive mantle plume that brought nickel-rich magmas from deep within the Earth. And after this time, volcanism was dominated by plate tectonics, the formation of subduction zones and island arcs. Magmas that were produced in these processes formed at a much more shallow depth, uh, than the mantle plumes and were nickel poor. This led to a diminishment of the amount of dissolved nickel in the oceans and this of course had profound negative consequences on methanogens which were so dependent upon nickel. There are a number of uh, good lines of evidence from sedimentary rocks formed at this time indicating that uh, atmospheric oxygen is increasing. Unfortunately um, I don't have time to touch on all of them but I'd like to talk about one of the more interesting ones that uh, I've read about. Iron pyrite, or fool's gold, is a sulfide, and it can form through volcanic or sedimentary processes. Now, there are two isotopes of sulfur. There's 32 and 34. Sulfur 32 forms much weaker chemical bonds. Therefore, organisms that utilize sulfur in, in the oceans tend to take that up much more readily and the ocean water becomes enriched over time in sulfur-34. Because of the abundance of sulfur-34 in ocean water, uh, pyrites that form through sedimentary processes tend to show an enrichment of sulfur-34 and that's an indirect indicator of sulfate fixing organisms. And since sulfate only forms when there is abundant oxygen, that is an in, uh, indirect indicator that atmospheric oxygen is increasing. And iron pyrites found in sedimentary rocks uh, formed at this time, 2.5 to 2.7 billion years ago, show just this sort of sulfur-34 enrichment. The initial effect of increased available free oxygen generated by photosynthesizing organisms was not an increase in atmospheric oxygen. Instead, uh, the oxygen bonded very readily with the massive amounts of iron that were dissolved within the oceans of the world. And this led over many millions of years to the precipitation of massive deposits of iron um, the banded iron formations found throughout the world, um, for instance in Minnesota or in Western Australia, were formed at this time. And they are alternating layers of hematite and magnetite, two different ores of iron, and um, layers of silica in the form of flint or quartzite. The decline of the methanogen ecosystem and subsequent increase of photosynthesizing organisms led to the eventual destruction of atmospheric methane. This had catastrophic impacts on world climate. For the first time in history, the world froze over. This was our snowball Earth 1, and it lasted for approximately 300 million years. This vast glaciation may have had the effect of inhibiting further growth in atmospheric oxygen, but eventually Earth's climate did recover. Uh, it's not within the scope of this video to speculate on how, but by two billion years ago there had been another major leap in the amount of atmospheric oxygen, perhaps as high as 18% of the atmosphere, and that's almost as high as 21% today. And that sets the stage for the coming Cambrian explosion. And perhaps I'll discuss that some other time. I'll fit this in.